Genesis chapter 39. You know, I forgot it was December. Did y'all forget it was December today? Usually after Thanksgiving, there's a Sunday before December starts, but it didn't work out that way this year. Six out of seven years, it's that way. Well, no wonder I didn't know it was December today. But I say that because 2019 is just about gone. We are quickly running out of the year. And tonight when we finish our text talk, we are going to have just a few chapters left in the book of Genesis, 46 through 50. 46 is the reading this coming week. And we'll be done with that Bible reading, and we'll be ready on January 4th to begin the reading for 2020. Someone said... That like, well, well, somebody told me, Les, did you tell me this morning that, um, that, that uh, life is like a roll of toilet paper, and the closer you get to the end, the faster it goes? <laughs> yeah, the truth is that quote gets attributed to Roger Frederick. Evidently, he's the one who said it first. So, anyway... Uh, we didn't get a lot of questions this month on our Bible reading, and I think that's probably for a couple of reasons. If your mom and daddy have been bringing you to a church a long time since you were a little kid, you probably have covered the material in this reading before, right? Somewhere along the line in Bible class, someone had knitted a coat of many colors, and maybe you even got to wear it along the way, right? So Joseph's story is a very familiar story, and then it was our fall focus, wasn't it? And so in October, we spent four weeks going through this section of the book, talking about the life of Joseph. So it is familiar territory, Max, and maybe that's why we didn't get as many questions this time uh, through. But that does give us the opportunity uh, maybe to dig a little deeper and explore some other interesting things and some of the connections to the Bible story. Because remember, Joseph's story isn't just a cool story. Uh, we've talked about this all year long. When we read something in our Old Testament, we need to ask, why am I being told this? Why is this here? And, and not just that it is an interesting story with some good applications, but how does it tie to the rest of the Bible story? And so tonight we'll try to work on that a little bit as we go through 39 through 45. Easy way to sort of remember what happens through Joseph's story is to remember the four houses that he'll find himself in. You'll want to write this down, Reuben. This is really cool. Joseph's four houses. In 37, you have his father's house, Jacob's house, right? In 39, he's in a new house, Potiphar's house. And then in 40, where is he? The jailhouse, that's right. And in 41, he's going to end up in Pharaoh's house, and that's how we go through the rest of this story. So coming back to 39, that's where we're starting tonight. 39 basically has three scenes, right? You start out with his success in the first six verses. We sort of get his resume and how he, how he does very well in Potiphar's house, the captain of the guard, uh, soldier of Egypt. And then in verses 7 through 18, we have the story of that temptation with Potiphar's wife. And then the last part of the chapter, beginning of verse 19, you have the consequences of all that or the punishment that he suffered. So that's sort of the story of 39. A couple of interesting things in 39. Let's start with this. Did y'all notice in verse 3 this statement that his master saw that the Lord was with him and the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands? Question, how did Pharaoh know that Joseph's success was due to the Lord? I think it has to be there in the text itself. You just read his master Saul uh, by observation. Jesus in Matthew chapter 7 said, by their fruits you shall know them. This man demonstrated good fruits in his life, and he recognized that something special, Potiphar recognized something special is going on in this, man's, this young man's life. Yeah, I, I, th I think we can also pick up on the pattern of Joseph's behavior through this episode in his life. If you jump ahead just a little bit, to chapter 40 in verse 8 when he's, when he's talking to the cupbearer and the baker, uh, he makes this comment in verse 8, do not interpretations belong to God. And then you get in 41 and he's going to say a very similar thing to Pharaoh. I think Joseph talked about the Lord. 
That's right. I think he talks about the Lord in Potiphar's house. And I think he, even when he's, think, now think about this. He's with the most powerful man in Egypt, someone equivalent, well, even more powerful than the president of our country. And one of the very first things he does when he's before Pharaoh is he talks to him about the Lord. And it would have been a great opportunity not to do that and just take the credit for himself, right? I, I think, uh, again, there's no way that, in, in a practical sense, that Potiphar is, is going to know about the Lord unless Joseph has said something. Yeah, I think that's right. So you put what he said and what he does, put those two things together, and Potiphar draws a right conclusion that the Lord is with him. And so do we even need to talk about the application? About the need you and I have to be talking about the Lord all the time. If he would talk about the Lord as a slave in Potiphar's house, and he would talk about the Lord as he stands as a prisoner before Pharaoh, when we're just mixing it up among our friends, shouldn't we be out there talking about the Lord like that? I think that's a great lesson to learn from his life. The other thing that I think is especially important in 39 is this repetition of his resume. I think we talked a little bit about that back in October. Did you notice that that happens twice in 39? At the beginning, we're told how He's promoted because he's successful uh, and grows to a greater and greater position in Potiphar's house. And then you get to the end of chapter 39, starting at verse 19, and the same thing happens again. He's made a prisoner, and he, he, he's promoted again and again until he becomes one of the most important prisoners uh, in, in the prison. And, and so you wonder why, when the Bible is ordinarily concise, why does the Holy Spirit feel the need to tell us all these details about his resume and how he continues to be successful in each of these settings. And I think, Max, it has to do with what's to come, that we're being given information that's going to become very important later on to understanding what God's doing here. Yeah, Joseph in Potiphar's house and then Joseph in the prison house, both times he, it demonstrates and validates his unswerving faithfulness to God. Uh, he's discharging his duties in a, in a proper way. And his faithfulness in these smaller things is actually preparing him for bigger things. Uh, yeah. I, I think that that's, I, I think sometimes we look at small stuff and say, well, that kind of stuff's not important. It's absolutely important. If you've got a job working in the plant or in an office or at a school, you ought to do the very best work you can because God may, by that, be preparing you for something greater. But if you slough it off, and you're not a conscientious worker, how can you expect God's blessing? And clearly God is grooming Joseph for important responsibilities later. I think we forget that he started out as a 17-year-old slave. Uh, and probably, if what, from what we know of his family, a kid who was a bit privileged and kept at home, probably not one that's ready to lead Egypt, would you think? Well, that's right. He starts out that way. And I, I think we can say that as you look at the story as it progresses, was there any single event in his life that made him the great leader that he became? There was none. Probably it's, not. It's what he did day by day, as I mentioned a moment ago, his unswerving faithfulness to God, not only in discharging his duties, but in resisting the wicked woman who was in that house. Yeah, and I think all along God has prepared him so that when we get to chapter 41 and he's called before Pharaoh and Pharaoh says, you're the man to lead Egypt in preparation for this family. Well, well listen, he doesn't need any training. They don't need to send him off to some seminars to get him ready. He's ready at that moment to stand up and take over this task. And so it's only after we get to the end of the story that we actually learn all that little detail along the way that seemed extraneous and unimportant to us. Now it's explaining to us how Joseph could do what he did. Because if we didn't have that stuff in 39, y'all would have filled the box up with questions like, how did this seven-year-old kid who's just been in jail all this time, how was he able to lead Egypt, right? Well, now we know. All along the way, God has been grooming him for the task. There were 13 years of faithfulness before he ever got to be second in Egypt. Yeah, sometimes life doesn't always turn around quickly, does it? <laughs> Another lesson to be taught there. We'll pass it's over it's the idea like, uh, Lord, give me patience and I want it right yeah, now. that's exactly right. We don't always get it when we want it. Hey, one other thing to note in verse 13. Have y'all been following his robes? 
Do you notice that, notice that the, the transition points of his life, we keep coming into, running into his garments? So, so in 37, he had a robe, right? Which one was it? The coat of many colors that his father had given to him. What happened to his robe? His brothers took it and dipped it in blood and used it as a tool to deceive his father. Do you see it? What happens in 39? He loses a robe again, doesn't he? And the robe is used to do what? To deceive Potiphar and to falsely accuse him to help advance this lie. And he's going to get another robe, right? In 41, when he's elevated, he gets new garments again. So at all these transition points in his life, we keep running into this robe. It's sort of an underlying theme that runs all the way through. The other thing I thought was interesting here was um, verse 19. Uh, you know, when we read verse 19, I think we jump to a conclusion or assumption about Potiphar. Uh, verse 19 is where his wife tells him this lie about Joseph. And do you remember why he was angry? Or that was not the right question. Do you remember that he was angry, right? The text says his anger was kindled. Who do you think he's mad at? Did you say that, Petula? The wife? Petula said the wife. That's not who I assume he's angry with. My first thought, he's mad at Joseph, right? Because who gets thrown into jail? Joseph. And yet it's interesting, Max. Maybe it's not Joseph he's angry at. Because if Joseph had committed the crime that Potiphar's wife had accused him of, what was more likely to be his fate? Don't you think that immediately Potiphar would have hauled him out and had him killed if he had attempted to assault his wife in the way she alleged? What gets this more interesting, folks, is as you follow this story, Joseph ends up in prison, not dead, and guess who runs the prison? You look at verse 3, and he was put in the custody and the house of the captain of the guard in the prison where Joseph was confined. Who is the captain of the guard? Did you realize that Joseph was in a jail run by Potiphar? And what happened in the jail? He got advanced again and again. And again. So you keep reading the story and you think, it does not sound like Potiphar is angry at Joseph. It's made me reconsider, Max, whether or not we've understood verse 19 correctly. I wonder if Potiphar is angry at the situation. Here he has this great slave who has made everything he does prosper. And now his wife has created this situation. And my guess is, knowing her behavior here, this is not the first problem she's created for him. And it's going to cost him his number one guy. And I can't help but wonder if that's what makes him angry here. Well, no matter what, imprisonment was still no light matter. Uh, he was put in chains in the prison, according to Psalm 105 and verse 17. He sent a man before them, that is, God sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They hurt his feet with fetters. He was laid in irons until the time that his word came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. And... Uh, the point is, he demonstrates faithfulness while he's in the prison. He becomes uh, like the number one trustee. He's actually in charge of the thing. And who would have ever thought that the way to the throne in Egypt was through a prison? But once again, uh, I cannot help but, but remind us all that Joseph demonstrated unswerving faithfulness to God. At what point is he giving up on God and throwing up his hands and saying, you know, I'm a good guy and bad stuff keeps happening to me. And listen, plenty of bad stuff happened. He was kidnapped by his brothers, effectively, sold into slavery, lied about by this woman, and then thrown into jail. A lot of people would have given up. Can't give up no matter what the circumstances of life. That's the lesson I just see over and over again in Joseph's life, regardless of Potiphar's anger, or, and it's easy to conclude, especially when Potiphar is actually the man who's the big guy over the jail. It's easy to conclude that he's angry with maybe with his wife, maybe upset with Joseph. He's been lied to. However you slice it, 
Joseph is faithful in all this. All the way through it. All the way. So we get to Genesis 40. Will you go there in your Bible? And I don't know, maybe my brain just naturally works in threes, but I see three segments to the story in chapter 40. In the first four verses, we're introduced to two new characters, right? You've got two of Pharaoh's servants who have offended him in some way, the baker and the cupbearer, and they're both cast into prison and into the prison where Joseph is. And so you might be starting 40 thinking, well, okay, so why do we need to know that? Why is that relevant? Well, because beginning in verse 9, Joseph starts interacting with these men. They have dreams. They're looking for an interpretation of the dream, and somehow Joseph winds up offering them that interpretation. And then in the latter part, beginning in verse 20, we're told about the outcome of how that, how that things worked out just exactly the way that Joseph said that they were going to work out. Now, all of that's important because in this, Joseph sees an opportunity, doesn't he? Yeah, the idea that uh, when he interprets these dreams, uh, there's a different message, though the, the two dreams are similar, there's a different message. In three days, something's going to happen to these two men. One of the men is going to be restored to his position, and the other man, uh, I think that te my text here says, in three days, Pharaoh's going to lift off your head. That's just a figurative way of saying you're going to die. And indeed, that's what happened to him. And it's interesting, this uh, three days later, it's Pharaoh's birthday. And evidently at his birthday, he releases the one man, restores him to his position, and the other man, he loses his life on that day. But there was a request that Joseph had made of the man who was restored. Go tell Pharaoh, I'm, I'm not here justly. This is an injustice against me. I shouldn't be here. Down in verse 14 of chapter 40, are looking there, chapter 40, verse 14, Joseph says to the cupbearer, only remember me when it is well with you, and please do me this kind, and please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh, so to get me out of this house, for indeed I was stolen out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also I have done nothing that they should put me into the pit. And so Joseph sees a chance to get out. One of these guys is going back to his position, and he thinks, well, here's my chance. He can plead my case for me before Pharaoh, and I can get out of here. But he doesn't. He gets back there, and the cupbearer evidently forgets, and whether that's used literally or not, he doesn't say anything to Pharaoh, and what, a couple of years pass, and Joseph is left in, in jail. Now, doesn't that just seem nuts to y'all? How could he not immediately tell Pharaoh about this dude in prison that can interpret dreams? You just kind of wonder how that could be. And yet, remember that the cupbearer is in an awkward position here, right? His buddy he'd gone to jail with was killed. Yeah. And he's just been restored to his service. Think of it from his perspective. If you're just looking out for you, it's not the best time to bring up some random Hebrew that you met in jail that interprets dreams and to say to Pharaoh, hey, could you do me a favor and let this guy out? Probably not the best time to start that conversation. Well, maybe he doesn't want to rock the boat, or maybe he's just a selfish man and saw no advantage to himself to say anything about Joseph. And the interesting thing is in verse 9 of chapter 41, he admitted later that he was wrong in not honoring Joseph's request. He did wrong in neglecting or forgetting Joseph. Well, he is going to bring him up he when we get to 41. But when it's a convenient time for yeah. him to bring him up, Pharaoh needs someone to interpret his dream. And now, it's, now he can help Pharaoh out by introducing him to Joseph. And makes himself look like a really good guy. And he gets to be the hero in the story. That's exactly right. So I'm with you. I don't think he literally didn't remember Joseph anymore. I just think maybe out of selfishness, whatever the motive, he's looking for a time advantageous to him well, that's right. to act on that. So it does, all this stuff about dreams, Max, does raise some questions about dreams and their meaning because a lot of people wonder about that. What are my dreams supposed to mean? Well... And we don't have Joseph to interpret. Yeah, Joseph, could in, Joseph of himself could not interpret dreams. He said that, and two or three times, he says that these interpretations are of the Lord. 
But when you look at the circumstance here, a lot of people today want to believe that their dreams have special significance. And the simple answer here is to say that we have no way whatever of knowing uh, that our dreams are from God or they have some particular significance. If God is sending us special messages by dreams, David, how should we distinguish those special messages from God from our ordinary dreams that we have every night? I wonder how many of us had strange dreams just three nights ago after a big Thanksgiving meal. Your dreams this past Thursday night may have been more the result of oyster dressing and giblet gravy rather than some special message what from is, God. What is oyster dressing? Your wife is a Yankee. Ask her. My so wife fixes cornbread dressing, buddy. I don't know yeah, what oyster oy dressing is. Oyster dressing is uh, what some of those folks over on the East Coast put in okay, their dressing. Okay, okay. But, but people want to believe that their dreams, not necessarily yours, but their dreams have special significance from God. And there's really no indication today that our dreams have special significance. God does not reveal his will today by means of dreams. God's will is revealed through means of the word of Jesus Christ in this book. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, God, who in various times and diverse manners spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his son. And his son's word is in this book. So when I read in Hebrews 1.1 1, 1, that God in time past spoke in various ways, God did speak in dreams, like to Joseph. He is one of those fathers, one of those patriarchs that God spoke to through dreams. But uh, God's revelation is complete. There is no special revelation coming today. And, and I, I think that we probably could even broaden the application of that beyond just dreams i think people are all the time trying to find god's message in things that happen for example i got up and it was storming this morning that meant god did not want me to go to heb now that may not be a bad idea to stay home from heb when it's raining outside i don't think it's a good idea to read something from god into the weather that day and i think people do that all the time listen folks God communicates to us today through his word. If we want to know what God has to say, that's where we need to be looking. You mentioned his revelation is complete. That's where we find his message in us, not in a dream we had or reading something that happens in our life as what we believe is an indication from God to go this way or that. We need to be cautious about that's that. That's really more superstition than anything. Listen, in this story of Joseph, God's providence is operating all the way through. God's providence is still operating today. But God's revelation is complete. We have a final, complete, and all-sufficient revelation in this book. And it's, it's important to distinguish between those two things. Because sometimes when we say, well, there are no new revelations today, uh, someone says, well, you think God's not doing anything. No, God is still in control of everything. God is master of the universe. God is in control. But the idea of him giving new revelation in itself is a fallacy, and it says that this revelation is incomplete and that it is inadequate, and I am not willing to take that stand. Let's go on to 41, because that kind of finish out this piece of the story. Uh, 41, again, three pieces there. First 13 verses, we have those dreams that Pharaoh has. In the beginning of verse 14, Joseph is called, and uh, he gives God's interpretation of those dreams. And then 38, everything changes dramatically, doesn't it? Everything shifts from Joseph. Suddenly, his life goes from being a mess to this guy is literally on top of the world. So if you pick up, for example, at verse number 40, he gets a new job. Pharaoh puts him over his house. In 42, he gives him a ring. He also gives him new clothing to wear. We keep finding these new clothes at the transition points in his life, a gold chain about his neck, a chariot to ride in, verse 43. Verse 45, he gives him a new name. And at verse 7, he gives him a wife to marry. And that raised a question that we got, Max. Was Joseph supposed to be marrying an Egyptian woman? Has not God frowned upon marrying outsiders, and here he is marrying an Egyptian. What do you think about that? I don't know. What do you think? 
I think we shouldn't approve that God approves of everything, assume that God approves of everything Joseph yeah. does. I, let me say it this way. Up to this point, has there been a revelation from God forbidding marriage to outsiders? No, there's not been a revelation. However, when Abraham wanted a son, or wanted a wife for his son, he went back to the homeland. And I think yes. that's the general pattern. I don't and, think. And when Esau married outside the family, it was bad, yeah. right? That gave yeah. grief to, uh, to uh, uh, Isaac and Rebekah. The interesting thing here is, though, two sons are born of this marriage, and that's Manasseh and Ephraim. And they become extremely important players in the plan of God when they get into the land. So there's a lot happening here that you need to know about because you want to know where these were Manasseh and Ephraim, yeah, where the boys came, came from. from. Yeah. Yeah. Well, l let's say this just because he did it, that doesn't mean that God approved of it or that it was what God wanted him to do. Sometimes we make that assumption, brothers and sisters, it's a dangerous one. If, if a good guy in the Bible does something, then we jump to the conclusion, well, God must have been okay with that, and, and, and God must have approved of it. Well, that presents a problem over here. Well, I don't know if God approved of this or not, because the text doesn't tell us that. No, no. And look, it was a typical thing for Pharaoh to give gifts to those that he approved of, and one of the gifts was this one. And he put him in charge, that's the last thing I would mention, verse 48, of collecting all that food during the seven years of, an, of abundance. That was going to be his job, to make sure that they stored plenty of food up for those seven bad years that were coming. Yeah, and so when you put the numbers together, he was 17 when he went into Egypt, 30 when he was elevated to second in Egypt, and now at the end of this first seven years, he's going to be 37 years old, and then we're going to see a couple more years to pass when his family comes down. Well, then that's our transition point. So look at the end of chapter 41. Look at verse 56. This is... This is where the, important, where the important part of the story, I think, begin, begins to come to the surface. Because in 56, the seven good years are over. And it says, so when the famine had spread over all the land, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. That we anticipated because we'd been told that was coming. But now look at 57, because it says, Moreover, all the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain, because the famine was severe over all of the earth. So we've gone from Egypt, now the earth, and then you get to 42 and verse 1. Who else has been affected by the famine? Yes, his father Jacob and his brothers and the rest of the Messiah's lineage are in the middle of a famine. And though we don't understand this, Max, their lives are literally in jeopardy, aren't they? They don't have food. In fact, what are they told? In verse 2 of chapter 42, Jacob says to his sons, Behold, I have heard that there is grain for sale in Egypt. Go down and buy grain for us there that we may live and not die. And so now, now Joseph's story, I think, begins to intersect the Bible story. Now we understand why providentially God brought him down there. Now we understand why God brought him into that position. All of this is taking place so that he can use him to preserve his family, to preserve the lineage of the Messiah. That's right. God made the promises to Abraham, and that, that lineage of Abraham was going to survive. So here it's happening. And it's a marvelous example of God working providentially to make sure his plan comes to pass. Yeah. You, you don't see uh, a bunch of miracles here, God dumping food out of the sky like he He's going to do that later. In the wilderness, yeah. In this case here, this is providence. God is going to feed these people by Joseph. And all along the way, years and years and years now, he's been putting that in order. So when you've got a problem in you li your life and you think there's no solution, would you remember Ephesians 4, is it verse 30? I could do abundantly beyond all that you could even think or, think or imagine. We need to remember, uh, God can fix things, folks. He's really good at that no matter how complicated and messy they may seem to us. Uh, okay, so what we want to do, we have eight minutes. Go. And Reuben will give us a hard time if we go over. 
Uh, we're going to group 42 through 45 because, candidly, it's just hard to break it. It's one story, right? And so in 42, first five verses, the brothers come to buy food, which brings them before Joseph. Picking up at 42 in verse 6 and going down to about verse 28, you have this interaction between Joseph and his brothers where he really just kind of messes with them all the way through this, doesn't it? Verse 9. He hides his identity. Yeah, he knows who they are, but they don't know who he is. I don't think that's a surprise because he went off as a kid and now he's a, now he's a grown man. And, uh, and he's changed a whole bunch, probably less than they have. Yeah, he's, uh, they haven't seen him in 20 years or more. Yeah. So verse 9, he says, accuses them of being spies. And then verse 15, he has such an advantage here. He demands they bring their brother Benjamin, and then he's going to demand that Simeon stay behind. And then he puts their money, verse 25 says, back in their bag and sends them home with that. And so he's just kind of messing with them all the way through this. And so then at 42 and 29, they go back home and they tell their father about all of this and tell them that they've got to bring Benjamin back to this man they met in Egypt. And the response of Jacob is actually very interesting. In 42 and verse 36, he said, you guys keep stealing my kids from me. You almost wonder if Jacob isn't getting suspicious. First you come back without Joseph, now you've come back without Simeon, and now you want to take Benjamin. Do you think I'm dumb or what? I mean, it's almost like he, he thinks something's up with these brothers. He's suspicious of them. Yeah, I, because of you boys, I'm losing, losing bunches <laughs> of you. And so that freezes everything. They're not willing to do anything. And, and so what I'm curious about is, is how long before you get to chapter 43 and verse 16. They come back, and they have a stalemate with their dad. They're not going back without Benjamin, and he's not letting them go with him. And so they just kind of wait. Do you think it was months, maybe a year, before they finally return? May have been. They said, look, we could have been there and back twice. Uh, so, you know, but we're not, the man said, you're not going to see my face again unless you bring your youngest brother. There it is. And so necessity requires it. They got to, the gotta famine is it. bad. They've got to go back and buy food. And this time when they come back in 44, well, before that, at the end of 43, this is 16 through 34, he has this big meal for them, which is kind of weird in of it. They're all set in the right order of age, and he's given special treatment to Benjamin and all that. And then he uses his cup to get them back, right? He tucks his silver cup into Benjamin's bag and then sends his people, the authorities, after them, and they find the, the cup in his bag and they bring them back and Finally, at 45, he reveals himself. We did have a question about the cup, because the cup is what kind of a cup? Well, it's called the cup of div divination. That's what the steward calls it in verse 5 of chapter 44. And then uh, later in verse 15, uh, Joseph says, what have, you, what have you done? Did you not know that such a man as I can certainly practice divination? And so we had some, we had a question raised, does that mean Joseph practiced divination? I think all of this is part of Joseph testing his brothers. That's my judgment on it. Uh, I don't see anything more in it than that. You know, I had never thought about that before because I had always considered that to be part of his ruse, that he's pulling on his brothers. He, he wanted them to think they had done some big terrible thing. And, uh, and, and I'd never really thought about the possibility that someone would conclude that he would involve, be involved in an unlawful practice like yeah. that. Uh, the truth is there's no explanation given in the text, but that's always been my conclusion, that it's just part of the setup uh, to get them to come back. But it does raise a broader question about how he treats his brothers here and why, why he would behave that way toward them. I think the answer to that question is found if you'll watch Judah. Well, let me comment on Judah. I, I think he's got an early history with this, right? By the way, we should mention back in 37, he's the one who came up with the plot to sell Joseph. Yeah, he's the one who came up with the plot to sell him. This is the same Judah uh, in 37. And Judah is also the same, this is the same Judah who was engaged in gross immorality in chapter 38. But now Judah 
is willing, in essence, to sacrifice himself. He says, let me take Benjamin's place. I will stay here. I will be your slave. Why? Because if Benjamin does not come back home, it will kill, kill my, my father. Yeah. Now, when he sold Joseph into slavery, he was willing to deceive his father. And not only that, he didn't care about his father's grief. That His father said, I will go down to my grave in mourning over the loss of Joseph having been killed by a wild animal, he thinks. That Judah uh, was a bad guy in 37. He's a bad guy in 38. But this man has changed. And you know, sometimes people say nobody ever really changes. This man now is concerned about his dad. And I think that is the point of everything you see in these chapters. All the stuff he's doing to his brothers here, I don't think it's just meanness, although it would have been hard to resist that, right? I don't think that's what he's doing, though. I think he is trying to ascertain are these the same men that sold me into slavery? And when you see how they, how especially Judah speaks of the father and his compassion toward Benjamin, willing to take Benjamin's place to, re, to protect Rachel's child, think about that. You know that these men are changed men. In fact, he's already seen hints of that because they speak in Joseph's hearing about the fact that all of this has happened to them because of what they've done to their brother. And so, so I think that's why in 45 then he's ready to reveal himself because he knows that they're different men. And I think that's what everything has been leading up to. Yeah, and in, and in chapter 45 he does reveal himself, puts everyone else out of the room and makes it clear to his brothers that he indeed is Joseph. And I think, and you, you look at chapter 45 and verse 5, Joseph says to his brothers, but now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. I think at this point, David, Joseph is putting two and two together and coming up with an understanding of the providence of God, that God has been directing this whole thing all the way along from the famine to the being sold into slavery uh, to being in Potiphar's house, jailed, and then coming up to Pharaoh's, uh, second in Pharaoh's house. I think Joseph realizes now God has been working behind the scenes this entire, this entire time. And I think this shows us, I, I pointed out earlier, that this man had unswerving faithfulness to God day after day after day through all sorts of bad circumstances. You know, people again say, oh, I'd love to be a leader in God's kingdom. Here is a great leader, one of the greatest we'll ever find in the Bible. But it wasn't just, boom, one day Pharaoh shoves him into the seat and says, hey, you're in charge. It was this man was being prepared all the way along, faithful to God day after day after day. That's what prepared him. He worked hard at whatever he did, whether in Potiphar's house or in the jail. He worked hard all the way along and was faithful to the Lord, unswerving. Uh, that's why he turned out to be such a great leader. But if he had not been that, if he'd thrown up his hands and given up, could God have used him if he was a quitter? We don't quit. This is being a, a servant of God is not about being a quitter or giving up. We need to hang in there and stay with God, and he'll bring us to where he wants us to be. Yeah, and seeing the hand of God in all of this gave him a completely different perspective on it. I think it's what enabled him to forgive his brothers because as he says over and over again you may have meant this for evil god worked it out for good well there's the issue of vengeance after i'm jumping ahead to chapter 50 uh in chapter 50 when when jacob dies the brothers say okay he's going to get us now yeah. but he says am i in the place of god yeah. uh, that vengeance belongs to the lord uh, this man understood his place and that if vengeance is to be done well, that's God's end of the stick. And we ought not to be in the business of whittling on God's end of the stick, trying to take personal vengeance. Got to wrap. Got to wrap. You know, there's something beautiful that happens here. In spite of all the troubles that you see in this family, we've commented over and over again how dysfunctional it was. But here you see family reconciliation. And Joseph receives his brothers and treats them with the utmost kindness. It's a family that is marked by sin, by hatred of Joseph, envy, all of these things. And it's always a good thing when family members are estranged to seek reconciliation. But most importantly, David, 
we ought to all seek reconciliation with God. To be reconciled means to be made friends again. And Jesus Christ has died on the cross to make you and me friends of God. That's what he wants. And if you believe in Jesus Christ, but you've not yet been reconciled to God, well, Jesus said, you're my friends if you do whatever I ask you. Jesus wants you to do his will. Faith, repentance, and baptism. If you will obey the Lord tonight, this is your time right here, right now, to obey him. Come now while we stand and sing.